Добрый день. Hello, everybody. I've, I'm working on my Russian, but I've got a long way to go. All I can say is, uh, uh, you know, koshka est mush, or whatever, you know. I can say little things. I don't learn anything useful yet, but let's get going here. Uh, yes, I'm Charles Nutter. I'm going to talk a little bit about Invoke Dynamic, uh, how it works in the JVM, what it's useful for, uh, how you can start to play with it. Uh, first things first, uh, there are some contact information for me. Feel free to email, tweet me, whatever. Uh, I'm open to questions, I'm open to having discussions and helping uh, clarify anything later on. Uh, I've been working on JRuby full-time for the past 10 years. First uh, at Sun, uh, then at Engine Yard, a Rails hosting company in San Francisco. Uh, and now for the past four years uh, working at Red Hat. Uh, and at the same time, also kind of a JVM enthusiast. I make contributions to the JVM. I work with a lot of the JVM folks, learn how it works inside and out, so that I can make JRuby run better and, and be a better Ruby implementation. Uh, and uh, JRuby, we are actually the earliest use of Invoke Dynamic ever. Uh, before it was even released in Java 7, we were already starting to play with it, test it out, uh, and it helped really uh, make, make Invoke Dynamic into a good feature. Uh, so this is what I tweeted uh, many years ago, right after, uh, right around when Java 7 was released. Uh, I still believe this. Uh, Invoke Dynamic is already changing the way we look at the JVM. It's being used not only for dynamic language features, but for new Java features. Uh, Lambda's in Java 8, uh, features coming up in Java 10 or 11 for doing uh, gener new generics, generating new classes on the fly. So it really has changed the platform. It's the biggest change ever, most important change to the JVM. So first, a little history. Uh, the JVM authors originally did talk about other languages someday running on top of the JVM. Uh, so even in the very first JVM specification, uh, they saw a future where we might have more than just one language running on top of this platform. And over the years, hundreds of developers and hundreds of languages have been written on top of the JVM. Uh, but the problem is that a lot, of those J a lot of those languages were different enough from Java that they didn't really fit. The JVM was kind of designed around Java and the way that Java works, and these languages often had to do a lot of, lots of ugly tricks to run well, to perform well, uh, and, and sometimes it was just simply impossible to make them fast and, and efficient languages. Uh, so JVM languages that we've seen through the years Early on, uh, we had implementations of Python in the Jython project. I think it was JPython at the time, and now it's J Jython. Uh, JavaScript in the Rhino project, and now we also have Nashorn and, and other implementations. Uh, but uh, there was really no official backing for alternative languages, no uh, work by Sun to support these languages until about 2006. That's when we, the JRuby team, joined Sun. We started to talk about Invoke Dynamic, about language features that we needed to implement Ruby, and it developed into Invoke Dynamic. Uh, so in about 2007, we kind of rebooted this effort that had been started earlier, uh, JSR 292, to add this feature for dynamic calls, dynamic languages on the JVM. Uh, and then after working through it for several years, we did ship it in Java 7, and it's been out there since then. So what is this Invoke Dynamic thing? How many people have heard of Invoke Dynamic before? Okay, good. So I would have, hopefully that would be a prerequisite if you're coming to an Invoke Dynamic talk. How many people have any idea what it is? All right, there's a few. All right. So I'm going to walk through basically all of the features that came in with Invoke Dynamic. Lots of examples here. It's pretty dense and there's a lot of code, uh, but it's all available on GitHub as well, and thankfully these talks are being recorded. So you can review it later if you like. So first off, is this, is this a feature that's only for dynamic languages? Uh, well, dynamic dispatch was, was the earliest uses that we used for in JRuby, and probably to some extent still the most common uses of in Invoke Dynamic. Uh, but there's many, many other features that you can do. So th this is not it. Uh, is it a new form of invocation? Well, yes. It, it can be used to call methods in ways that are foreign to Java, unusual on the JVM. Uh, but there's also, again, more uses than even just calling methods. Uh, so we won't, we won't go with that definition. 
Uh, is it just simply a new bytecode that does some dynamic language features? Well, yes, there is a bytecode, but there's a lot of other backup APIs that go along with it, uh, support, you, support features within the JVM. Uh, so it's more than just a bytecode, too. So there's really two things that come along with Invoke Dynamic. So there is the, the bytecode, Invoke Dynamic, the bytecode that was added to the JVM spec. Uh, but there's also this idea that we have real method pointers now, uh, called method handles, uh, that are faster than reflection, they can be passed around as an object, uh, but they are essentially function pointers. And so the two things combined give us a tr tremendous amount of flexibility. All right, so that's Invoke Dynamic, a user-defined bytecode with a set of method pointers and ways of manipulating method calls. You take these two together, you get Invoke Dynamic as the feature. Uh, and if we look at it in, term, in the uh, actual terms of the JSR, in the terms of, of Invoke Dynamic, that would be the bytecode that we have and a bootstrap method for setting it up, and then method handles on the other side to be your function pointers. Uh, so here's the URL for the code if you want to go take a look at it uh, offline and uh, walk through some of the examples. I've got lots of comments in there to show how all this stuff works. So first off, we're going to talk about the method handle API. Uh, this is where you're going to start playing with it more, more quickly. Uh, if you're not doing any bytecode work and you're not going to actually do an invoke dynamic bytecode, the method handles API is still very useful. So what are method handles? Well, I mentioned that they are function pointers or method pointers, so you have that. You can also have a method handle, like a callable object, uh, that represents a field or uh, an array entry. Uh, basically, all the things that you can do with reflection today, call methods, modify fields, uh, but optimized much better, uh, designed so that the JVM can treat this as if you were actually just calling that method directly or accessing that field directly. Along with this, you can modify arguments as they come in. So if you're calling a, a, a math.max function, you can say, okay, well, I want to double one of these values before I call it. Box that up together. I'll show some examples of this later. You can have flow control. So rather, whereas a, a simple reflected method is just take these arguments, pass it to the method, you can have it do some decision logic along the way. Maybe I call method A in a certain case or method B in another case. Uh, and then again, this is all optimized by the JVM. So these end up being faster than reflected methods and fields, uh, and all of these adaptations inline and JIT and do all that cool stuff the JVM does. Uh, so the package that we're looking at is Java Lang Invoke, uh, and these are the main classes in there that you'll be playing with. Method handle, which is that invocable target, that invocable function or field or pointer. Uh, method type, which basically just back boxes up uh, a return value type and a set of argument types into a, a little object, a representation of that method's type. And then the method handles class, which is used to get those function pointers, uh, manipulate them, wrap them with adaptations, and so on. Uh, so here's two different ways that you can get this method handles.lookup object. The method handles lookup object is uh, sort of your factory for pointers, for method pointers, field pointers, and so on. Uh, the first case here, where we're just saying, give me a lookup, it will say that it, it, will, it, it will allow you to access any methods and fields that you could at this point in the code. So rather than having to do set accessible tricks on Java Lang reflect method, uh, rather than having to expose internals of an object or private methods, if you can call it from here, this lookup object will let you have pointers to those functions and pass them around and use them. Uh, the second one is prob basically what you would expect. Uh, only things that are public will be accessible through this. So if you're going to be giving this lookup object out to someone else, you don't necessarily want them to be able to call your private functions. You might use a, pr a public version of that lookup. Uh, so once you have your lookup object, there's methods here that, that are similar to the reflected versions. Uh, so getting method pointers, find static, find virtual, so for finding uh, static methods and instance methods. Uh, we also have special and constructors. I'll talk a little bit more about what those are later. Uh, and then field pointers. So find getter, find setter for accessing instance fields. And find static getter, find static setter for accessing static fields. Very similar to what you have in reflection. So far, it's not really unusual. Uh, here's an example of a few of these. So 
Up at the top, we've got just the plain Java code. We get a property, Java home, uh, and here's a, a hello world printout. So if we want to do this in method handles, we need to have our, our two types. So the type of system.get property is that it returns a string, and it takes one string argument here. That's the one, that's the signature that we're interested in. The type for print line is that it takes a void, or it returns void, it doesn't return anything, and it takes any object to print out. So that's our print line. Here we have our lookup object that we uh, acquired earlier. Find static on the system class, the get property method with this type, returns string, takes a string. Uh, similar on, the, uh, on the, the print stream class, we're going to find a virtual method, an instance method, named print line that has this signature. Void return takes an object argument. Simple enough, very similar to the reflection API, uh, except for the addition of this method type object that we use. And then down at the bottom, we invoke it, just like we would a reflected call. Uh, so invoke get property method handle does the java.home lookup. Uh, take system.out and you invoke the uh, print line method handle on it, hello world prints out on the console. So pretty simple, uh, easy, very similar to reflection, uh, but both of these invoke calls down at the bottom, the JVM will be able to optimize those much better than they do, than it does for uh, reflected objects. All right, uh, another little example here. If we want to access a field, system.out, we do a lookup, find static getter on the system class, look for the out field, that has the type of print stream. And now down at the bottom, print stream out three, we've got system out method handle dot invoke, and it will go and get that static field for us. Again, fairly similar to reflection, nothing too fancy at this point. Uh, here is an instance field. So we've got some little structure that has a name field of type string. Here's the example that we would be doing if we wrote it in Java, create a new structure, uh, put uh, the value tom in there. Uh, here is the invoke dynamic version. So we have our lookup, find setter on the myStruct class. The field we're looking for is name, and it has type string. And down here we invoke it on our myStructure object, and this time we'll set the name to Charles. Okay, still very simple. This is, a, is about as far as uh, reflected, reflection go went as, uh, as far as having reflective features. You could call methods, you could access fields, that's about it. The interesting stuff starts to come in when you want to adapt these. You want to uh, modify the way that they do these calls. Uh, and there's a bunch of different ways we can do this. I'll walk through a few examples. There's a couple dozen different ways of doing method handle adaptations. Uh, so the first one here would be uh, manipulating arguments. So you might want to insert arguments in. You might want to drop arguments. You might want to uh, modify those arguments as they go through. Uh, we'll look at this more graphically. It's a little easier to see it that way. So let's say we have a handle to a foo method. Uh, the foo method takes two, two variables, the two values A and B. Uh, and here now we have our, our method handle that also takes two values A and B and returns whatever foo returned. So here's our little function pointer for foo. We want to wrap this with, uh, let's say, an insert an argument. So instead of having two arguments that we have to pass into our method handle, we want to only pass one in, because we know the value A is always going to be 42. So we're creating a new version of this method handle. And instead of taking two arguments, we just pass in one argument. It fills in the blanks, calls our foo value, and the return value comes all the way back out again. But it's still just a method handle. It's still like a Java Lang reflect method object but it's doing this extra logic for us without us having to generate any extra code, without us having to do anything um, dynamically. Uh, let's look at an example in code here. So here we are using our get property method handle and our print line method handle from before. Uh, and we know that we always want to look up java.home in this case. So insert arguments using our get property method handle at argument uh, offset zero, that's the property name, and stick Java Home in there forever so that we have a new handle that always looks up java.home. Uh, similarly down here, insert arguments into our print line, 
we always want to do a system dot out or system out print line in this case, rather than having to go get it every time. Now we have a method handle that will do system out print line every time we call invoke on it. And then down at the bottom here, we invoke the one, takes no arguments now, but it gets the java.home property. Second case, system out print line, invoke with arguments, all we have to pass it is the string we want to print out. So, a, a simple adaptation. Uh, let's look at a little bit more complicated one. You can also filter arguments. Uh, this allows you to modify them as they're passing through. Uh, so in this case, we're going to take in two arguments, as we, as we expect for our foo function, but we know we always want to divide a by two before we pass it through into the foo method. So, a comes in, it gets divided by two and passed into foo, b comes in and goes straight through as it is. And then whatever foo does returns its value and that comes out the other end of the method handle. Uh, looking at this in an actual code example, so here we have a, a, a method that will take a string and uppercase it, okay? So we're gonna make a handle for the uppercase method, which is a find virtual on our string class. To uppercase is the name of the method that we're looking for, and it just returns a string. So you've got a string in hand, you call this method, you get a new string that's uppercase. Here we're going to uh, do some casting. This is kind of like, uh, like in reflection where usually things end up being object in the middle, you want strings on the other side. So we're telling it, okay, we're working with this as objects internally. Down here, filter our arguments. So we've got our system out print line method handle. We're going to take whatever the first argument is, the zeroth, zeroth argument pa that's passed in, we're going to uppercase it, and then it will proceed on to print it out. So take in our in this case, this will be upcased string. It will upcase it, print it out to the console. So now we've got two adaptations on here. We're actually, we're upcasing the string that's passed in, and we've already got the system out print stream. So we can just call it this way. All right, uh, another little example here. I'm, I don't have code for this one, but you can also fold arguments. Uh, folding arguments basically says, uh, I've got whatever arguments come in here, pass them all to some method that, that calculates based on that, does something with those arguments, and gives me a new value. That new value becomes my first argument to the, to the wrapped handle. So we've got B turn, goes into upcase B, that becomes the A argument, and then B passes through as the second argument, just as it is. And then again, foo does whatever it does and, and returns out the other side. So you can do fairly advanced modification, manipulation of these uh, arguments. Uh, there's also reordering them, uh, removing arguments if you don't, if you want to just ignore one of the arguments that's coming in, and so on. And again, all, all optimizes together, all turns into uh, fast optimized JVM code under the covers. All right, so let's look at some flow control. Uh, so the flow control uh, features that I'm going to talk about here are guard with test, which is basically just a Boolean branch. You give it a test function that will give return a, bool, a, a true or a false, and then depending on what that returns, it will call your true path or your false path, your then or your else. Uh, and a switch point is very similar, but instead of having a Boolean method that you, you call, it will just have an on-off switch. And once you've switched it off, it stays off. Uh, that's the old slide, here's the better one. Uh, so here's, we'll look at guard with test first. So we've got two arguments coming in. Uh, this time we've got a foo method that takes both arguments and a bar method that takes both arguments. So this test handle will take a look at those two arguments, A and B, make some determination, make some calculation, uh, and then depending on whether it returns true or false, this handle will call either the foo method or the bar method and return whatever value results from that. Again, still all in this one method handle object. You don't have to see what's under the covers. You don't have to write extra code around it to do this branch. It's just built into the method handle API. Uh, example in code. So in this case, here's the, here's the, uh, the Java code that's equivalent to what we want to do. So randomly, we want this function to either uppercase it or lowercase the string, just based on a random Boolean every time. So here is our up-down 
handle. So this is the, the, uh, the test that's actually just going to return a Boolean randomly, either a true or a false. Uh, and it just has a simple method type, returns Boolean. Here's our guard with test. So get that random Boolean from the up or down, and then if it's true, call uppercase. If it's false, call to lowercase. Down here, we do our filtering. Uh, in this case, we're taking our system out print line and we're using our up or downer as what we want to do. So we want to do our up down randomly and then pass that to print line so it'll print out. And now down at the bottom, we've got randomly, it will uppercase or lowercase that string before it prints it out. And we're still just doing a method handle dot invoke. Pretty cool. Uh, so the example for a switch point, it's also a guard with test. Uh, but as I said, it's either on or off. It starts out on and it will call the true path. And then you can flip the switch and it will start following the false path. Uh, this is useful because if you have, for example, a cached data and you want to know when that cache is bad, you just want to turn it off. It's invalidated at that point. You want to always start following the other path and not use the cached value anymore. So we've got our on. It's going to call all the foo path, or the, the true path in this case, and call foo. We turn it off. Bam. Now forever it will call the bar handle. It'll follow the false path. Uh, an example in Java. So this is the Java code. Essentially what's happening inside the method handle. We've got a volatile Boolean on field here uh, that says whether we're supposed to follow the true path or not. Uh, if it's true, we will call the two uppercase. If it's false, we call two lowercase. And at some point in the future, we can turn this off or invalidate it. And it will always follow the false path then. So here is with our other handles. We create our switch point object. We have our upper lower switch guard with test. And then here is the true path and the false path. So we evoke it a couple times, leaving it true, leaving it turned on, and we get the uppercase behavior. We invalidate it, which turns that switch point off, and now it will start doing lowercase. And still just a method handle dot invoke, all wrapped up inside one little function object for you. All right. Uh, now, I, uh, again, I don't have a code example for this, but some of you might be thinking, okay, well, what about other Java constructs? What if I want to do uh, exception handling? Well, there is an exception handling way uh, in method handles API. Uh, the catch exception method will let you take a handle, wrap it with a try catch. If an exception is thrown, it calls the other handle you give it. So it's basically like putting together a try catch yourself. Uh, and then throw exception. If you've got an exception passed in, you can just have it rethrow it, just like you would in Java if you didn't want to handle the exception for whatever reason. This is what it looks like conceptually. So here we have our foo and bar method. In this case, if foo throws any exception, any throwable, we want to call bar. And then if foo is good, it will return its value. If it goes into the catch section, it will return the value of bar. Down at the bottom here, catch exception, wrap our foo handle. If we see a throwable raised from it, call the bar handle. And again, it all just becomes one method handle object. Method handles dot invoke has the exception handling and everything else wrapped up inside it. It's pretty cool. So that's the method handles API. Uh, there's a lot more that you can explore in there and play around with. You can think of it as really smart, really fast reflection. It's basically what it is. So let's look at the bytecode now. How many people have uh, done any work with JVM bytecode? All right, cool. So there's a few folks here. Uh, hopefully nothing that I show will be too complicated. I'll, I'll walk through some of the examples here as well. So let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the JVM, the basics of the JVM here. So the JVM has around 200 opcodes, uh, and I would say about 10 or 16, if you count all the different types, uh, long, double, and so on, are actual endpoints, interesting endpoints. Uh, and these are in invocation, so you're calling some method. A field access, so you are setting or getting a field somewhere in the system. These are the bytecodes for it. And an array access, so you're putting something into an array or getting something out of it. And these are kind of the interesting ones. 
uh, all Java code is going to have to do one of these at some point. Otherwise, it's not actually going to do any useful work for us. Uh, so all Java code revolves around these. The remaining operations are stack manipulation, uh, local variable sets and gets, uh, flow control, if, then, and so on. Uh, but if, until you call a method or put something in memory in a field somewhere or an array, you're never going to see the result. So you've got these endpoints with all these support bytecodes around them. And so the problem here, the JVM spec defined these 200 or so opcodes. Uh, all bytecode had to live within those 200. If you couldn't do what your language needed with those invokes, with those field accesses, uh, you were kind of stuck. You had to wire up your own way. You had to write a lot of extra Java code to make this work. Sometimes you couldn't make these features work at all. Uh, it'd be too complicated to fit into this set of bytecodes. Uh, and so this was the case for dynamic calls, uh, for certain types of lazy initialization, and other non-Java features that we didn't really have. So the goals of JSR 292, the goals of invoke dynamic, were to have a new bytecode. Let's just add one more bytecode that can do everything. It just lets the user define how it works, rather than trying to add a new dynamic call bytecode, adding a new uh, lazy initializer bytecode, and keep messing up with the, uh, the, the specification, adding more stuff to it. So a, a user-definable bytecode that you can program yourself, essentially. Then we have all these method pointers and adapters, so that's our fast function calls, rather than using reflection like some, some uh, dynamic languages had to do. And then the key is that both of these things should fit together and optimize as if it was a regular JVM method call, as if it was just as fast as a normal static Java call. Uh, and obviously, let's try to avoid doing future modifications. Make this really flexible so it can support all sorts of new features in the future. Uh, so let's take a look at the invocation types that we have. Uh, so this, this is code that we've all seen something similar. You know, we've got our static calls like current time millis or log. We've got our virtual calls, which are calls on an object. We have interface calls, which are calls against an interface, as you'd expect, a list here or a runnable. Uh, and then wh what's called special calls. Uh, this includes constructors uh, calling the super method from this point and so on. Uh, and these boil down to four different bytecodes that we had for invocation on the JVM. Here's what they look like if you were actually to dump out the raw bytecode. We've got invoke static, invoke virtual, invoke interface, and invoke special. Now, if you take these four bytecodes and you break them up to, into their component pieces, what they actually do at the JVM level, you'll see that there's a lot of duplication here. There's a lot of the same things happening. Uh, checking that we've got the right argument types or the right target object type. Uh, looking up the method on some class. We've got to go find that method object, that, that function in memory somewhere to call. Uh, ideally, we're going to cache it somehow. Uh, and then, you know, know if the method's changed, know if new code was loaded into the system. Uh, and then, of course, at the bottom, we're going to eventually inv invoke it. So wouldn't it be nice if we could take these pieces that make up all of our invocations and mix them up a little bit, do them the, any way we wanted to? And that's basically what we get with Invoke Dynamic. So Invoke Dynamic will call your, your bootstrap. It'll ask you, the developer, what do you want me to do at this point? I don't know how to do this invocation. You take these method handles do all your adaptations, go look up function pointers, go look up field pointers, give it back to the JVM, and then it optimizes straight through as if it was a real static Java call. And this is a little, a little difficult conceptually, so let's look at it in a little bit more graphical way. So here we have our, uh, a switchboard, a telephone switchboard from uh, World War II times here. So we've got our, 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 our lovely lady on the left represents the, uh, the code that we're writing, so this is us routing a method call in the system. The switchboard is the JVM. That's the, the runtime, the program that's doing something. So we get our invoke dynamic bytecode up here at the top, and it says, okay, I've got an invoke dynamic. The JVM calls back to our code and says, okay, what do you want me to do with this invoke dynamic? It calls our bootstrap method. It's just a piece of Java code that wires up method handles. The bootstrap method goes out, grabs function pointers, does adapting, uh, does some branching logic potentially, and then gives those method handles back to the JVM. So now we've got 
the, uh, uh, an invocable object that represents our function that we want to call some behavior. Now here's where the magic comes in. From then on, the JVM can go straight through to that target method. It doesn't have to ask you again. And even better, all of this just disappears. So as far as the JVM is concerned, this is a straight through static call at that point. It'll optimize just like any other Java method call, significantly faster than doing it with reflection, works great for dynamic languages and so on. So now, getting into actual examples of the bytecode. Um, a couple tools that I'm, I'm using here, uh, some of these you'll see in the examples, some are worth, worth checking out. Anybody who's done bytecode stuff on the JVM has used the ASM library, kind of the de facto standard that everyone falls back on, actually uh, shipped internally with the JVM now as far uh, from Java 8 forward. Uh, I'm, I'm using a, a library called JITEScript, which wraps around ASM, gives you a nice little DSL for, for generating bytecode. Worth checking out if you do any bytecode work. And then I'm using another library of mine called InvokeBinder, which again is like a DSL wrapper around the method handles API, just to make it a little simpler, easier to, to read through the code. So the first example, just doing a trivial invoke dynamic bytecode and wiring it up. Uh, so we're gonna have an object uh, show up here called a call site. The call site is basically just like a holder for the method handle. When the JVM calls your bootstrap method, you need to give it back a call site object. That call site has a method handle in it, it can be invoked, the JVM installs it at that point. That's that fast path, that straight through path that you get from then on. Uh, and there are a few different types. Uh, the first example here will use constant call site, which has only one method handle ever bound to it. Mutable, unsurprisingly, you can change the method handle that it points at later on. Uh, and volatile, which has, you know, similar to, to volatile fields, uh, different semantics concurrency-wise. We won't cover that one today. So here is our method that we want to call dynamically. Um, it just has a, a static counter here that's going to be incrementing over time. Each time we call it hello world with whatever number we're on in the counter. So this is the, this is the method that we want to call. Here is what our bytecode looks like. So we have our invoke dynamic. And, uh, here, we're, we're basically stuffing this into a runnable, so we have a little uh, callable runnable object. Uh, just for, for simplicity here, I'll, I'll omit that. So invoke dynamic, the, the method that we want to call dynamically is foo. We know that it just returns a string. And then we give it this bootstrap handle. I'll, I'll show you what that is a little bit later, but it tells the JVM, here's, here's the method to call to find out how to do this dynamic invocation. Uh, and then here we're just going to do a print line of the string and return from our, our runnable.run. All right. So here is that boot handle. Uh, and this is a part of the ASM API. Uh, it's a little cumbersome. The interesting bit here is that we're essentially saying we want you to call our static method called simple bootstrap that will return a call site, as I mentioned before. It will take a method, it gets a method handles.lookup. So the invoke dynamic bytecode passes a lookup in to your bootstrap so it can go and get those method pointers and so on. Uh, it will get that string name that we're trying to call dynamically and then whatever method type we were called as. And so in this case, just returning a string. Here is our bootstrap method. Again, like I said, it's returning a call site. It receives a lookup, a name, and a type. We've got our constant call site, so this has to have a method handle when it's first created because you can never change it again. So new constant call site, we find the static method, which in this case will be foo, returning string, and now this invoke dynamic will never go through this code again. It doesn't need to look at this anymore. It knows how to call this method totally dynamically at runtime and optimize it as if it was statically written in the Java code. So here we have our runnable that we've produced from this with our invoke dynamic. The first call will go through that bootstrap and we've got our hello world number one. And all the, all the subsequent calls will just go straight through and optimize directly through. So hello world two and three, never touch the bootstrap again. Okay? So let's do a little bit more interesting example. Not very exciting to have a dynamic call that never changes. It's always gonna be the same method. Uh, so let's toggle between two targets. Uh, First, we're going to call one method, and then we're going to call the other, and then go back and forth. 
So here we have the two methods we're going to call. Uh, so we want to print out first and then switch it so it'll call second next time. And then it'll call second, print out second, and then switch back to the first one. So it'll go back and forth between these two methods. Kind of a, a little simple example of, of how to change this. So our invoke dynamic, bytecode doesn't look a whole lot different. Invoke dynamic, we're going to start with the first method. Uh, it doesn't return anything. All it does is print out. Uh, and then there's our bootstrap handle again. Uh, there is the bootstrap, essentially the same as before. This time we're going to use our mutable call site bootstrap instead. So, mutable call site bootstrap. Same signature, call site, lookup, name, and type. This time we're going to create a mutable call site. We give it the type that we need for this, so that's the void return type, essentially. Uh, here I'm using invoke binder because it's a little bit lighter weight code. So we know that we're, we're, we have no arguments and we want to return void. So insert into that call our mutable call site. So we want to pass it through so we can change it later on. So we pass in our mutable call site and then we do a static invoke of whatever that name was. In the, in the first case, it's just going to call the first method. Uh, set our target into the call site and return it. Now the JVM is wired up. It knows that we're going to be doing this switching back and forth. Let's take a look at what first and second actually look like. And if you'll notice here, this whole section in the middle is basically being repeated in each of the first and second methods. So first off, we, we start with whatever method was, was requested. Here we are in the first logic. So we've got our, our lookup and our, our method handle, or our call site, our mutable call site. So we're going to get the second method, a pointer to that. We're going to put that into our call site for next time, and then do our print. Going to the second one, almost nothing changes here. There we go. Now we're in the second method. We look up the other one, put it back in, and print out our second. So now it'll switch back and forth each time we make these calls and go from one method to the other and back again. And here we go with our example. First, second, first, second, first, second. And it's all done dynamically at runtime and optimizes like it should. Okay, so now the big one, actually doing a, a dynamic dispatch, like a dynamic language. So for dynamic dispatch, the, the target method, the function is not going to be known until runtime. We're going to have to go find it uh, based on the method name, potentially based on the, the arguments, the number of arguments, the type of arguments, and so on. So we need to dynamically look up this method after we've done the bootstrapping process. Uh, so in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to implement a little dynamic language called stupid script, because it's really stupid. Uh, these are, this is the entire language specification right here. We can push a string onto the stack. There's only strings in this language, so you better be happy about that. Uh, you can call a function, which basically says, take this number, uh, this many arguments off of the stack and do a call, do an invocation. And then we can do some trivial uh, method definitions. So define a method, uh, it takes a certain number of arguments, and then it has some code inside it. So it's a, it's a very basic dynamic language. There's not a whole lot of flow control, but we can define functions and we can call them. Uh, and then there's only one built-in function that we've got, which is print, and that just does a system out print line for us. So our implementation, which has massively glossed over here, you can take a look on the repository uh, on the link on GitHub. Uh, we've got a simple parser that generates AST nodes. So we've got our representation of the structure of the code. We're going to walk those nodes, turn them into bytecode with invoke dynamic. Uh, that script then becomes our runnable object. Uh, and then anything that you def in there becomes another method on that same object. Uh, here's a simple example. So calling a, a method with no arguments, we push the name of the method, and we say send. So do a call with no additional arguments. So it'll call hello with no arguments. Uh, here's calling with one argument. So we push the name print, we push a hello world string, and then say call print with one argument. And that's our, our second little script here. Uh, here's what print looks like, just to, to kind of clarify that. So we've got a couple different versions of it, one that just prints out nothing, a new line, and one that will print out the argument we pass in. And then defining a function. So let's def a hello function. It's going to push the name print, 
push the string hello world, call print with one argument, and that's the function. That's all there is to it, okay? So here is the main body of our stupid script compiler and parser. Uh, we read in our script, and this, this language is so stupid, it only allows one file name ever. So it's gonna just go look for the stupid .script file in the current directory. We are going to parse it and turn it into an AST, so we, now we have the structure of the code, and then pass that to our compiler and get a runnable out. You can go look at the details of this online if you want to, not important for what we're talking about here. So here is the actual bytecode logic, taking those AST nodes. So if we have a push node, if we see a push in the code, uh, we're just gonna take that, whatever the push argument was, load it onto the JVM stack. LDC is a load constant. If we are doing a def zero, which is a, a zero, uh, zero argument method, uh, we're going to define a new function for it, basically just recurses down, does another compile of all of the body of that method. Uh, and here, a, a single argument method is similar too. So this is where the real magic happens. So what does send do? This is our dynamic call. So send needs to basically figure out how many arguments it's gonna be. So parse the, the number of arguments that were given for this. So if it was a send one, okay, we've got one argument that we need to take off the stack. We're going to load the script itself because we need to call it on, on our object, on our script object. And then down here, we'll switch on however many arguments it is. So if we've got zero arguments, we're going to invoke dynamic the send logic. Uh, it doesn't return anything. There's no return values in stupid script either. So you'll have to just deal with that. Uh, this is the name of the function that it's going to get, is get passed in. And then this is our script object. And then down here again, the name of the function is the first argument. Uh, the argument that we're passing in is the second one. And then we've got our script object that also comes along for the ride. So here's what our bootstrap looks like. Uh, very similar to the first, first second example, first and second example. Uh, mutable call site, the logic for send needs to use the do send method, which we'll show in a minute. Now we're all wired up, now we're set up for doing dynamic invocation. All right, here is our do send. So we've got our mutable call site, we've got the method name that we want to do, that we want to actually invoke, uh, and here's our script object. So if the name was print, well, let's go get our built-in print function and wire that up. If it turns out that we want to call a user-defined method, like our hello that we defined, uh, well, we need to go find that hello method, and eventually we set it back into the mutable call site. So we're dynamically cho choosing which method to call at runtime by looking at the values that were, were provided on the stack. And then we can invoke it at the bottom and actually do the call. So here is our, our simple script. This is the largest script I've ever made with stupid script here. So we define our hello method, we push the name print, we push hello world, call print with one argument, uh, and then for the actual body of the script, call hello with zero arguments. And there it goes, prints out. So it dynamically does this all with very little code and it, it optimizes like any other uh, statically typed language on the JVM. So I know that's a lot to take in. Uh, I recommend having a look at the method handles API as a first place to start. Smart function pointers, faster than reflection, works very similar to how reflection works. So it's, it, it's a fun way to get used to the, the, the new features of Invoke Dynamic. Uh, if you want to go down to the next level and actually do some bytecode work, you can uh, have a look at some, uh, I've got a bytecode for dummies talk that kind of walks you through how to do your own bytecode emitting, how to do your own compilers. Uh, of course, you can look at the examples here and see how I've chosen to make this simple scripting language. Uh, and then for other language, or for other information, I've got a bunch of articles on my blog about how Invoke Dynamic works, the, all the internals of it. Uh, you can certainly follow me or ask me questions, email or, or tweet me, and that's, to that's totally cool. Uh, if you Google for Hedius Invoke Dynamic, uh, there's an article I wrote in about 2008 that breaks down in great detail how Invoke Dynamic works all the way through, uh, why we use these, why it does these things, what problems we're trying to solve, and how to put it all together. So you can read through that as well. Uh, and then there's many other talks out there about Invoke Dynamic and bytecode that'll, that'll help you get bootstrapped on that. 
And I think we got uh, about 15 minutes for questions. Awesome. So, any questions about this? Method handle API or invoke dynamic? Yes, up front here. Could you please show again the slide where you explained mutable call site? Okay. Yeah, let's go back here. Uh, go to the, we'll go to the simpler mutable call site example. Uh, probably I don't understand, but why uh, should we use that binder.from? Can you simply create the method handle using that lookup object? Right. So yes, you can. You can. Uh, oops. Yes, you can certainly just do the, the standard method handle API. Uh, binder here is from my little library, Invoke Binder. It's just a, a wrapper around the method handles API that makes it a little easier to read through. So it's in essentially like uh, lookup find, uh, find static. Right, exactly. So here we give it the lookup so it knows how to handle doing lookups on its own, uh, and then it just is able to do those other method handles calls for you. I see, thank you. Yeah, just for simplification purposes. Other questions? Right up front here. Uh, well, <clears throat> do you have any micro benchmarks that uh, shows how, that show how uh, invoke dynamic, how Indy beats uh, reflection? Right, so performance wise, uh, do, do we have any benchmarks? Oh, I've got thousands of benchmarks. Um, so we, we use Invoke Dynamic very heavily in JRuby. Uh, all method calls go through Invoke Dynamic. Uh, a bunch of, uh, in Ruby you don't have a set number of fields and they can be, you can add fields and remove fields at runtime. So those have to be dynamically looked up too. That's all Invoke Dynamic. Uh, tons of other stuff that actually uses Invoke Dynamic. And for, like a benchmark that's a, you know, a data structure, if you're making a tree or you're walking a lot of objects, JRuby can actually perform pretty much identically to Java, doing those same calls and accessing those fields. So it really does work. Uh, for just calling method handles in Java code, uh, the method handle object itself optimizes as if it was just the direct call. And the JVM actually can't optimize and inline it like you were doing a static call in many cases. Uh, so micro benchmark wise, method handle calls are w certainly way faster than reflection, and in most cases, basically the same as just doing a plain Java call. So does that answer your question? All right. Yes. Okay. So you say that uh, uh, that met method handles is much faster than reflection. Yes. Uh, but. Uh, it's, it uh, ha has very similar API. Why it's not possible to optimize reflection in this case? What is the difference? Right, good question. Uh, so why is it not possible to optimize uh, reflection the same way? Uh, it could be done. Like you could go in and modify the reflection API so that it uses method handles internally. But there's a few problems with method handle, or with the, with the reflection API. Uh, number one, when you call with any number of arguments, it always ends up boxing it into an array because it's a var args call. So that's one complication. You're going to get that array object that you don't necessarily want. That's going to slow things down. Um, in number two, internally, uh, reflected method objects and reflected field objects have to check if it's a, a legal call for you to make. If it's a private call or a private field, it needs to raise an exception. So that logic has to be wrapped around in there. Uh, the method handle API gets around that by making that determination right away. So it gives you a function pointer that no longer has to check private or public. It knows if it's going to be callable or not. Uh, and then internally, the reflection API, since it's all just written in pure Java, everything gets turned into an object. So if you're calling with primitives like ints or longs, those get boxed into integer and long objects within reflection. And then once you get out the other side, then they're finally unwrapped again. So all of those things make it difficult to optimize reflection the same way. Uh, we could probably at least take the innards out of reflection, take this inside part out, and use, use method handles internally to reduce some of that overhead. But the way the API is designed, there's going to be overhead that you just can't get rid of. Right over there. And then we got one more back in the corner there. Uh, is there any difference uh, between uh, 
method handle way of uh, calling getter and set as an object or a uh, reflection way? Well, so there's not as much logic around getting and setting a field. Uh, in the reflection case, it will have to do that visibility check all the time. Uh, if you're setting and getting a primitive field inside reflection, it's going to be boxed. Uh, method handle doesn't have to do any of that. So the method handle, once you've got the, the pointer to this field, it is a straight through access. And it optimizes as if you just set or got that field directly. Do you have follow up or anything? Sure. Oh, we got one more here. Uh, I'll come back to you. Yes. You did show an example where you did relink the target each and every call, right? I wonder what is the JIT implication of such logic? Will this code ever be JIT compiled or will it stay in interpreted mode? So what actual code would it be if we relink each and every call? Uh, so is the question, uh, does, this, does this stuff JIT, like, like regular Java code, or...? I mean, uh, just-in-time completion. So what will be the machine code generated out of such Java code that relinks target on each and every call? Okay. Uh, I, I think I might understand what you're asking. Um, so the, the, is it about all the adaptations, like inserting arguments and folding and whatnot, and, and whether, whether you'd have that instead of the Java code? Sorry, when we have pure Java code that calls right. the specific method, a JIT compiler can foresee that and inline logic. When right. we change uh, our target each and every call, I think it might make life for JIT compiler more difficult. Okay, okay, yeah, I got it now, I got it. Yes, so if you have just plain Java code and you're just doing normal method calls and normal fields, field accesses, Yes, the JVM knows how to optimize those things, does a great job with Java, and, and inlines and optimizes all of it together. Uh, the method handles actually do optimize just about the same uh, as far as the JVM JIT goes. Uh, so it will see all of these adaptations. It will basically smash it all together. In, in, essentially, it inlines all of those method handles together as one piece of code, and then compiles it and JITs it down almost the same, exactly the same as if you were to write that Java code directly. So it does optimize pretty much the same way as if you wrote the, the Java code by hand, but you're essentially building this up dynamically at runtime. Want to clarify or anything? We can, we can talk in the discussion area too, so we'll write something out. Uh, let's see, who else? Right there? Speaking about those uh, method handle com combinations like uh, insert argument, drop argument, and so on, uh, wasn't it better to use some bytecode generation library like ASM to generate some simple methods which will do the same instead of using that combination? Sure, sure. So why would you, why would you do this rather than doing bytecode generation? Yes. Uh, uh, only about a quarter of the room had ever done bytecode generation, which is one reason. So this is an API that you can do some simple modifications, simple flow control and so on, without ever having to emit any bytecode and still get essentially an object that is just as fast as if you generated JVM bytecode. Now for folks that do know how to generate JVM bytecode, yes, you certainly can. You can generate your own bytecode. Uh, so then you have to load that class, uh, manage its life cycle, uh, if you want it to be garbage collectible, you've got to do a whole bunch of tricks to make it go away once, the, once it's dereferenced. Uh, whereas the method handle, it's just an object. It's an object. The JVM manages generating bytecode behind the scenes, manages jitting all that stuff for you, uh, and it's just a regular object. So it's, it reduces some of this ceremony that, that we would have if you were going to generate this bytecode yourself and gives you just a straightforward API to do it. I'm probably wrong, but I guess uh, there is, uh, anyways, by code generation behind the scene, uh, lambda form is generated. And, right. Uh, but uh, is it still better than manual by code generation? Uh, well, so it's been a few years of optimization that, that's gotten us to this point. But the method handles that you would generate with the Java examples that I have previously, uh, so for example, Let's look at 
Guard with test, I think, is a good one to look at. Uh, yes. So here is our, our regular Java example that would just call the method random boolean, and then depending on that, would do these other calls. The method handles that we build up here, these handles that we're creating and the handle that we have down at the bottom, internally the JVM will essentially turn it into this. And it will basically, in, you, I, I think it's possible to even see the bytecode that goes along with this, and it'd be very similar. And then once it jits, it'll jit just like this would. So again, you don't have to do any messing around with, with, with bytecode and loading it and dealing with classes and class loaders and all that nonsense. You can just do the method handle version, programmatically create this function object, and it will do all the generation for you. Okay, thank you. All right. Last question. Last question. Um, what was the motivation to build JRuby in the first place? Ah, okay. JRuby question, that's cool. Um, and I have JRuby stickers if anybody wants JRuby stickers. Um, so I actually didn't, uh, didn't start the project. Um, Tom and I picked it up and adopt it after the fact. Uh, but initially, I believe the, the, the original creators, I, I, uh, Tom's met the guy, I have not met him ever before. Uh, he basically wanted to start by doing a Ruby parser so that you could use it for IDEs, tooling, editors, and whatnot. Once they had a parser for the Ruby language, they just kind of went, well, why don't we just make Ruby on the JVM? Uh, and over the years, it's, it's evolved a lot. Uh, when I got involved in the project, it was kind of, kind of behind the times. It was two or three versions behind regular Ruby. Uh, it wasn't very fast, wasn't a lot of performance. And I, I saw there was a lot of potential in this. We could make a Ruby that would run really fast, take advantage of the JVM JIT and the GC, be able to call Java libraries, and still just be regular Ruby code. And so that's, that's what it's become now. It's, it's Ruby with all the capabilities of the JVM and all the Java libraries that are out there. So yeah, definitely check out JRuby if, you, if you're interested in Ruby or if you've ever done it before. It's a lot of fun. And I think that's it. Thanks very much.